This is Space Time Series 23, Episode 128. Coming up on Space Time, a new look at the evolution of the Milky Way galaxy, Earth mini moon CD3 determined to be a natural celestial body, not space junk, and China launches a mission to bring back material from the moon. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Some hypotheses on how the Milky Way formed are about to be rewritten following new discoveries about the behaviour of some of its older stars. New observations about the orbits of the galaxy's low metallicity stars, long assumed to be among the most ancient in existence, have found that some of them travel in previously unpredicted patterns. In astronomy, all elements other than hydrogen and helium produced in the Big Bang 13.82 billion years ago are considered metals. As stars age and fuse more and more light elements into heavy elements, they increase their metallicity. And when those stars die, their material is recycled into new generations of stars, which are therefore born with naturally high levels of metallicity. One of the study's authors, Professor Gary DeCosta from the Australian National University, says stars with low metallicity, containing less than one thousandth the amount of iron found in the sun, are some of the rarest stars in the galaxy. Previous studies have found these stars are almost exclusively found in either the galactic halo surrounds the galaxy or in the galactic bulge, the region around the galaxy's centre. While studying some 475 of these low metallicity stars, DeCosta and colleagues were surprised to find that a significant number, about 11%, weren't orbiting in the halo or bulge, but in the Milky Way's disk, following an almost circular path similar to that of the Sun. The discovery was quite unexpected, and it will force scientists to rethink some of their basic ideas about galactic formation. The ancient metal poor stars were identified using the ANU Sky Mapper and 2.3 metre telescopes at the Siding Spring Observatory in far western New South Wales, together with the European Space Agency's Gaia spacecraft. The low metallicity content of the stars was identified by the telescopes, and then Gaia was used to exactly determine their orbits. The authors found that the orbits of these ancient stars generally fell into one of a number of different patterns, all but one of which matched previous predictions and observations. As expected, many of the stars had largely spherical orbits, clustering around the galaxy's stellar halo, a structure thought to be at least 10 billion years old. Others had uneven and wobbly paths, assumed to be the result of two cataclysmic collisions with smaller galaxies in the distant past, creating structures referred to by astronomers colloquially as the Gaia Sausage and Gaia Sequoia. Surprisingly, other stars were found to be orbiting in retrograde, effectively going the wrong way around the Milky Way galaxy, and a few, about 5%, appear to be in the process of leaving the Milky Way altogether. And then there were the remaining 50 or so with orbits aligned to the galaxy's disk. DeCosta says future scenarios for the formation of the Milky Way galaxy will need to account for all these findings. In the Big Bang, the Big Bang made hydrogen, helium and a little bit of lithium, but it didn't make anything else. So all the elements, oxygen we breathe, the calcium atoms in your bones and so on, have all been made in stars. The very oldest stars basically had no metals in them, elements heavier than hydrogen and helium. But when they supernovaed, ended their lives, the nucleosynthetic products from their cores get distributed out into the gas and new generations of stars form from that gas. And this goes on through multiple generations. So the metallicities of stars build up as a function of time. So the sun has about 2% of its mass in metal. But if we find a star that has a very low iron abundance compared to the sun, then the quite reasonable assumption is that that star must be quite old, formed very early on in the formation of the galaxy. The stars we're looking at are extremely metal poor. They have iron abundances of order one thousandth of the iron abundance of the sun. And since 
the chemical elements basically in stars get filled up as a function of time. If you have uh, very low abundance, then you're looking at a very old star. And so these are stars that presumably formed about the same time as the galaxy itself formed. When I go through my university astronomy textbook, Universe by Freeman Geller, uh, it tells me very clearly that metal poor stars orbit in the halo and the galactic bulge. And I guess that's still true, but... Your research shows they do more than that. Tell me about it. Well, that statement is true. Most of them do, in fact, orbit in the halo or in the bulge. But in our work, we found about 10% of our sample were, in fact, orbiting in the disk of the galaxy, very much like the sun. And the expectation is that, in fact, most of these metal poor stars formed before the disk of the galaxy formed. But what we found is that, in fact, actually extremely metal poor stars must have formed in the disk of the galaxy because we find them orbiting in the disk of the galaxy. And are these population two stars or are they already population ones? No, they're by definition population two stars. Well, I suppose it depends on your definition of population. If you regard low metallicity as being a definition of population two, uh, then they're uh, uh, population two objects. Yeah. But if you wanted to say that you define populations by their orbits, which is what has been done, then they would be population one stars. They uh, don't match the standard definition that metal poor stars are in the halo and metal rich stars are in the disk. Yeah, let's let's go with metallicity and uh, you know how close they are to the original population trees in terms of heritage. What is this telling you about? how the Milky Way itself was formed, because that's what this study's really all about, isn't it? Exactly. Uh, I mean, the, the standard theories of the formation of the Milky Way basically have the gas that collapses into the disk from which disk stars formed had been enriched by previous generations of halo stars so that uh, its metallicity wasn't, ex- uh, of the lowest metallicity stars forming in the disk wasn't expected to be as low as we find these stars to be. And what that means is that low metallicity gas must have been able to find its way into the circular orbits in the disk of the galaxy and then form stars without having been enriched by metals from uh, other generations of stars. And that's surprising. We, did, we didn't expect that to be the case. There's been collisions with other galaxies. Sagittarius dwarf has slammed through the disk of the Milky Way at least twice, possibly three times. There's been a lot of mixing going on there, yet these pure disks of low metallicity have remained. That's right. I mean, uh, some of the other stars in our sample, uh, we have been able to connect to those kinds of accretion events that you're talking about in the distant past, where smaller galaxies fall into the Milky Way and get disrupted by the Milky Way's gravitational field. But in fact, what our results suggest is that in fact the disk must have been fairly stable for a long time, that it hasn't been substantially perturbed, otherwise some of these very old metal poor stars uh, would have been knocked out of their circular orbit. Tell me about how you did your research. Well, there's basically uh, three stages to the research. The first stage is we used the ANU SkyMapper telescope at Siding Springs, which has been doing a, a survey of the southern hemisphere sky. And it has a special filter as one of its uh, filters, which enables us to select candidate extremely metal poor stars. And we take those photometrically selected candidates to the ANU 2.3 meter telescope, where we look at their spectrum with the WISE instrument, and then we identify them as being extremely metal poor. And we find about 20 to 25 percent of our uh, candidates turn out to be extremely metal poor. And then knowing now which are the very metal poor stars, we can go to the Gaia European satellite, which has done a fabulous job of measuring Mm. the motions of stars. And then we can turn those motions uh, into uh, the orbit of the star. And, you know, most of them turned out to be halo, but a few turned out to be orbiting in the disk. Where do we go now? Well, I think the, uh, the ball gets batted back into the theorist's court in the sense of now we need to uh, have them produce models that can produce extremely metal poor stars orbiting in the disk of the galaxy. You know, when we have found these stars, now they need to have an explanation. This has been very much an international effort, hasn't it? That's right. The, the team that we have uh, has astronomers uh, basically in Europe and the US, and the research was actually led by an Italian PhD student, Giacomo Cordini, who spent three months here at Mount Stonewell in Canberra conducting the research. That's Professor Gary De Costa from the Australian National University and Astro3D, the Australian Research Council's Centre for Excellence in All-Sky Astrophysics in Three Dimensions. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Still to come... Astronomers have characterized the second only known mini-moon of Earth, a newly discovered asteroid designated 2020 CD3. And China launches an ambitious mission to bring back soil samples from the moon. 
All that and more coming up on Space Time. Astronomers using data collected by the 4.3 metre Lowell Discovery Telescope have hoped to characterise what is the second known mini-moon of Earth, a newly discovered asteroid caught in Earth's gravitational pull which has been designated 2020 CD3. The observations reported in the Astronomical Journal have helped to clarify both the rotational rate and orbit of this diminutive body, the latter helping to prove that CD3 is a natural celestial object and not another spent up a stage of a rocket. Many moons are asteroids which are temporarily captured into orbits around the Earth. They get caught up in Earth's gravitational well, orbiting around the Earth as the Earth orbits around the Sun, and eventually are flung back into interplanetary space from whence they came. The first known mini moon, 2006 RH120, was detected 14 years ago. CD3 was discovered back on February the 15th this year by the University of Arizona's Catalina Sky Survey. Due to the rarity of many moons, a global effort was undertaken by astronomers to study this object in detail. 23 scientists from 14 academic institutions in seven countries took part in the research using a multitude of telescopes. By measuring CD3's light curve, that is its changing brightness over time, using the large monolithic image on the Lowell Discovery Telescope, the authors established its rotational rate to be about three minutes. The rotation rate was probably the largest unanswered question of the research. The Lowell team showed that it's rotating much slower than anticipated for an object of its size. And they were also able to precisely measure CD3's position to refine its orbit. This information, combined with CD3's physical characteristics, such as an apparent infrared silicate composition, indicate it's a natural celestial object, rather than a titanium rocket body. And this distinguishes it from that other recently discovered object, 2020 SO, which scientists are now pretty sure is the upper stage of NASA's Surveyor 2 spacecraft. The study estimates CD3 to be approximately 1.5 metres in diameter, about the size of a small car and it's come to within 13,000 kilometres of the Earth at closest approach. Observing objects this small is challenging and requires a telescope big enough to see them. In addition, their transient nature means the window of time available to observe them can also close quickly. So, you've got to get as much data as you can in the limited amount of time you have available. This is Space Time. Still to come, China launches a sample return mission to the Moon, and later in the Science Report Skeptics Watch, the Nullarbor UFO incident. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Following in the footsteps of the United States and the former Soviet Union, China has launched a mission to bring back material from the surface of the moon. Beijing's Chang'e 5 mission aboard a Long March 5 rocket comes just over half a century after America's Apollo 11 moon mission brought back the very first samples from the surface of another world. The Long March 5 uh, rocket is getting ready to lift off. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, ignition. Lift off. The four boosters provided 90% of the thrust during the lift off. Mm. So uh, on this stage, mainly the thrust is from the four boosters. Mm. Uh, and uh, after pitch over, the next uh, uh, critical step will be the separation of these of the four boosters. boosters. Yes. yes. The launch from the Wang Chang Launch Center on China's Henan Island in the South China Sea follows in the wake of the Chang'e 3 and Chang'e 4 missions, which also landed on the lunar surface with Chang'e 4 achieving the first ever landing of a spacecraft on the lunar far side. Once on the moon, Chang'e 5 will spend 14 Earth days drilling down to 2 metres below the surface. It will then use its robotic arm to collect up to 2 kilograms of rocks and regolith for return to Earth. 
To do this, the samples will be transferred into an ascent module mounted on top of the landing module. This will then be launched back into orbit where it will dock with a return module for the journey back to Earth. The mission will only remain on the lunar surface for a single lunar day, 14 Earth days. That's because the lander lacks the radioisotope heating units needed to withstand the Moon's freezing nighttime temperatures. The European Space Agency is assisting China with this mission, providing ground support using its network of satellite communications dishes. This is Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. New Phase 3 trials will be undertaken on the Oxford University's AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine after serious protocol errors were uncovered in the initial Phase 3 interim results. The preliminary data reported in the Lancet Medical Journal claimed the vaccine was 90% effective if administered at a half dose followed three weeks later by a full dose. Surprisingly, however, it was only 62% effective if administered in two full doses. The company has now admitted that the half dose was given to trial participants by mistake and that only 2,741 people were given the half dose compared to 8,895 who received the two full doses. The error means researchers relied on post hoc subgroup analyses, which increases the risk of finding false positives, and so renders the trial too small to draw firm conclusions, hence the need to commence Phase 3 trials again. The vaccine's made from a weakened version of the common cold adenovirus, genetically modified so it's impossible for it to grow in humans. The Australian government's already ordered 30 million doses of the vaccine, which will be produced locally by CSL in Melbourne, with the first doses available by March. Earlier Phase 2 trial results have already shown that the new vaccine is better tolerated in older people compared to younger adults, and it produces a similar immune response in both older and young adults alike. That study of 560 healthy adults included 240 over 70-year-olds and showed that the older group had fewer adverse reactions, like temporary pain or swelling at the injection site. The deadly COVID-19 virus has now killed over 1.5 million people and infected more than 60 million others since first spreading out of Wuhan, China a year ago. A new study claims eating so-called honey or champagne mangoes could reduce facial wrinkles in older women with fair skin. Mangoes, like other orange fruits and vegetables, are rich in beta-carotene and provide antioxidants that may delay cell damage. The randomized clinical study involved 28 postmenopausal women with Fitzpatrick skin types 2 and 3. These are skin types which tend to burn rather than tan. The women were divided into two groups. One group consumed half a cup of mangoes four times a week over four months, while the other group consumed a cup and a half over the same period of time. Facial wrinkles were then evaluated using a high-resolution camera system. The study looked at the severity, length and width of fine, deep and emerging wrinkles. Researchers from the University of California, Davis, found postmenopausal women who ate half a cup of mangoes four times a week saw a 23% decrease in deep wrinkles after two months and a further 20% decrease after four months. But the findings reported in the journal Nutrients also showed that women consuming a cup and a half of mangoes over the same period of time actually saw an increase in wrinkles. The findings show that while some mango may be good for skin health, too much may not be. It's unclear why consuming more mango would increase the severity of wrinkles, but researchers speculate it may be related to a robust amount of sugar in the larger portions. A new study has concluded that close Homo sapien relatives Neanderthal had thumbs designed for squeezing rather than the precision movement which modern humans use their thumbs for. Scientists digitally mapped out the thumb and thumb joints of five Neanderthals and compared them to the remains of five early and 50 modern Homo sapiens. The findings in the journal Scientific Reports show that while Neanderthals could shape their hands for pinchy precision grips, such as holding a pen, that's if they had pens back then of course, which they didn't, their thumbs made it more difficult and they would have naturally preferred a more squeezy grip, 
the sort modern humans would use when holding a hammer. South Korean and Russian researchers have developed a revolutionary new thin interactive holographic display which can be viewed from a wide variety of angles. Current thin panel holographic displays are limited by computational power and the amount of pixels that can be controlled. And importantly, they really only look good when viewed from directly in front of the display. The new technology introduces a holographic video processor and a special backlight and light tilting mechanism, increasing the viewing angle for 3D videos by 30 times. A report in the journal Nature Communications claims this could make it easier to incorporate holographic video displays into mobile devices and household electronics. When it comes to great Australian UFO stories, there are three which stand out. There's the Westall High School sighting when, on the morning of April the 6th, 1966, a group of students and their teachers saw what they describe as a UFO flying over their school in the Melbourne suburb of Clayton South. The UFO then descended into a field adjacent to a grove of pine trees somewhere behind the school and disappeared forever. An investigation by Australian skeptics suggests that the sighting may have been a nylon target drogue towed by military aircraft for other military planes to chase as part of a training exercise. Then there's the case of Frederick Valentich. The Valentich disappearance occurred in October 1978 when the 20-year-old pilot disappeared while flying his Cessna 182 light aircraft from Melbourne's Moorabbin Airport to King Island in Bass Strait. Before disappearing, Valentich radioed Melbourne Air Traffic Control that a UFO was flying near him and, in his own words, it wasn't an aircraft. Wreckage of the plane has never been found. Valentich had taken off in the late afternoon, early evening, and has thought what actually happened was that he became disoriented and ended up flying upside down, thereby seeing the lights of his own aircraft reflected in the water. And then, as Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics explains in the current issue of Skeptics magazine, there's the story of the family driving through the outback when, according to them, a big glowing ball tried to lift their car off the road. This was during the 80s when a family called the Knowles family, a mother and three sons, were moving from Perth to, I think it was Victoria, but anyway, they're moving from west to east and they decided to drive most of the way in one go. It's a long trip and they were swapping the driving of it and one after the other and therefore they were driving through the night and at about 5am Western Australian time, just not far before the WA South Australia border, That's Euclid, had an way, incident. Folks. That's a place called Eucla. Yeah. I've, having driven uh, that road many times myself. So. Have you? I haven't. I've never been that far. I know. I've flown over it. I've driven to Darwin a few times as well. I used to work I've, driven, I've driven up to Darwin too. I love it. Yeah, first day huh? you go from Sydney to um, just after Cobar. Uh, I don't drive at nights because I don't want to kill kangaroos no. on the road and things like that. Right. So just uh, Sydney to Cobar the first day. Second day, uh, Cobar to roughly... Imba. And then the third day, you, you make it north of Alice Springs, or almost as far as Barrow Creek. And then the fourth day, you motor into Darwin. Lovely. So we did that same route. We went out through Broken Hill, yeah. down through the Clare Valley. That barrier in Adelaide. is incredible, isn't it? It's fabulous. Except when you do it at sunset. It's the, it, it is a hell road at sunset because the yeah. sun sets directly in front of you. Well, this is the issue with the Knowles family who were driving at 5 a.m. heading east. So the sun would just be rising. Now, they're tired. They're probably in various states of sleep. And what happened was they reckon something tried to grab the car, lifted off the road, and they crashed. They didn't crash badly. They were just run off the road, basically. And they came in and a tire blew. Either they managed to get into a place called Mundrabilla, where there's a roadside station, or they someone came out to see them. I'm not quite sure which. So this story was elaborated on suddenly from fairly flimsy evidence. They saw lights. They saw this noise. They were shocked. There was evidence of ash, they said, on the car and all sorts of suggestions that a flying saucer came down and lifted them off the road and dropped them. Obviously, either it was too heavy or they weren't particularly interested. They That got picked up by the media so the everywhere. didn't work properly on the UFOs. <laughs> the a Ford Telstar. How heavy is a Ford Telstar with four people in it? Well, the anyway. giveaways in the name Telstar, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So then... People came out to see it. The, the, the local constabulary had a look at the vehicle, the tyre, etc. They collected some material. Initially, 
that was supposedly sent to police forensics in Adelaide, I think, and uh, they assessed it. And because a lot of the UFO groups grabbed onto it and they were UFO research groups and they wanted to have a look and talk with the family. The media wanted to talk with them. Several did. Several did rather rudely, actually. The family were probably genuine in their belief. There's no indication that they were making it up. But uh, the problem came down to interpretation. And the suggestion was lights hitting them in the face, the driver, rising sun, at that time, sleepy, and they're heading straight. Sleepy, sleepy. Sleepy, west to east, ran off the road, fell asleep at the wheel, ran off the road, burst a tyre. Uh, local police who reacted to the story about this ash being taken out for analysis said rubbish. He took a little bit himself, a couple of slides, he said a bit of sticky tape, and pulled off some dust. He said it's dust. Yeah. It's nothing to indicate ash. I can attest the outback does get dusty. It does occasionally, doesn't it? Yeah. Some of this material was taken, the tyre, for instance, and that sort of stuff, were taken for investigation by other people, which found out that the dust ash is entirely consistent with road wear. Right, driving along the road, you're throwing up and it gets stuck to the car. Just the wear and tear on tyres and brakes and dust and whatever from the road. And that's what this ash was. It wasn't ash. It was just the usual grime you get from driving. But this was a huge story. It was big. And it's sort of still around. Probably one of the two highest profile UFO stories in Australia. Yeah, the other one being the Valentich disappearance. This is the aircraft over the Bass Strait. That's the one. Yeah. Yeah. The guy who was flying his light plane. And then suddenly he was uh, attacked by a flying saucer or something and crashed and never to be seen again crashed into the water all sorts of theories we covered this one too in our magazine in detail looking at the transcript of the radio reports and that sort of stuff and really the indication I was he got disoriented possibly even turned upside down which um, happens apparently yeah, especially it's at amazing, night yeah it's amazing how often that does happen I mean this is what happened to the Kennedy kid as well in the United States he ended up flying upside down yeah on his way to Martha's Vineyard and, and you know, people often believe or don't believe their, their meters and they can fly, be flying upside down and not being aware they're doing it. So when they, they're going up, they're actually going down and you can crash into the water. If people aren't trained to fly on instruments, then uh, they're easily fooled by their senses, more easily than Absolutely. they realise. And that's fatal. That's, that, that is fatal and that, that's the trouble with people's senses. They're very unreliable, especially after a period of time anyway. But the theory about the Knowles family from a sceptical point of view, was that they were misinterpreting various things. They were assuming things. They were either half asleep or asleep, um, and they ran off the road. Or they were distracted, possibly by a road train lights coming the, uh, towards them, or a road train behind them, and they see them in the mirror. And the clanking and the wear and tear, dents on the car. The One of the laboratory people said, that's old dents. They've been there for a long time. Doesn't indicate that somebody tried to grab them and pick them up. Yeah, yeah nobody said they were not sincere. Yeah. That, but, but being sincere doesn't mean you're right. I guess the only... Major other UFO story that I can think of in Australia would have been the uh, that one about the UFO that rose near the school in Melbourne. Yeah, uh, it must be. It's not one I know a lot about, but we have some people, including one of our guys in Melbourne, who's an expert on that, and he's spoken about that particular case. And it was sort of ending up being a case of, I don't know, if this is sort of uh, politically incorrect to say schoolgirl hysteria, that they built up with each other the story and the scaredness of it all, yeah. and it just became, they all believed it, even those who didn't see it. And that, uh, yeah, it was, it was an interesting story. This sounds a bit like the um, Mandela syndrome. Yes, the Mandela syndrome, yeah, where people sort of were either there or, or they believe that uh, he died in jail when he didn't. Yeah. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from Spacetime with StuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. 
And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 